Hello listeners. Today's story is one of the pen work of Rabindranath Tagore. The name of the story is The Auspicious Vision. So let's start with the story. The main character of the story is Kanti Chandra. So here we begin. Kanti Chandra was young, yet after his wife's death, he sought no second partner and gave his mind to the hunting of beasts and birds. His body was long and slender, hard and agile, his sight keen, his aim unerring. He dressed like a countryman and took with him Hira Singh the wrestler, Chakkan Lal, Khan Sahib the musician, Mian Sahib and many others. He had no lack of idle followers. In the month of Ogran, Kanti had gone out shooting near the swamp of Naidigi with a few sporting companions. They were in boats and an army of servants. In boats also filled the bathing ghats. The village woman found it well not impossible to bath or to draw water. All day long land and water trembled to the firing of the guns and every evening musicians killed the chance of sleep. One morning, as Kanti was seated in his boat cleaning a favorite gun, he suddenly started at what he thought was the cry of a wild duck. Looking up, he saw a village maiden coming to the water's edge with two white ducklings clasped to her breast. The little stream was almost stagnant. Many weeds choked the current. The girl put the birds into the water and watched them anxiously. Evidently, the presence of the sportsmen was the cause of her care and not the wildness of the ducks. The girl's beauty had a rare freshness, as if she had just come from Vishwakarma's workshop. It was difficult to guess her age. Her figure was almost a woman's, but her face was so childish that clearly the world had left no impression there. She seemed not to know herself that she had reached the threshold of youth. Kanti's gun cleaning stopped for a while. He was fascinated. He had not expected to see such a face in such a spot, and yet its beauty suited its surroundings better than it would have suited a palace. A bird is lovelier on the bow than in a golden vase. That day the blossoming reeds glittered in the autumn dew and morning sun and the fresh, simple face set in the midst was like a picture of festival to Kanti's enchanted mind. Kalidos has forgotten to sing how Shiva's mountain, Queen herself, sometimes has come to the young Ganges with just such ducklings in her breast. As he gazed, the maiden started in terror, terror. The hurriedly took back the ducks into her bosom with a half article cry of pain. In another moment, she had left the river bank and disappeared into the bamboo thicket hard by. Looking round, Kanti saw one of his men pointing an unloaded gun at the ducks. He at once went up to him, wrenched away his gun and bestowed on his cheek a progious slap. The astonished humorist finished his joke on the floor. Kanti went on cleaning his gun. But curiosity drove Kanti to the thicket wherein he had seen the girl disappear. Pushing his way through, he found himself in the yard of a well-to-do householder. On one side was a row of conical thatched barns. On the other, a clean cowshed at the end of which grew a zizif bush. Under the bush was seated the girl he had seen that morning sobbing over a wanted dove, into whose yellow beak she was trying to wring a little water from the moist corner of a garment. A grey cat, its four paws on her knee, was looking eagerly at the bird, and every now and then when it got too forward, she kept it in its place by the warning 
tap on the nose. This little picture set in the peaceful midday surroundings of the householder's yard instantly impressed itself on Kanti's sensitive heart. The checkered light and shade flickering beneath the delicate foliage of the zezev played on the girl's lap. Not far off, a cow was chewing the curd and lazily keeping off the flies with the slow movements of its head and tail. The north wind whispered softly in the rustling bamboo thickets, and she, who at the dawn on the river bank had looked like a forest queen, now in the silence of noon showed the eager pity of the divine housewife. Kanti, coming in upon her with his gun, had a sense of intrusion. He felt like a thief caught red-handed. He longed to explain that it was not he who had hurt the dove, as he wondered how he should begin. There came a call of Sudha from the house. The girl jumped up. Sudha! came the voice again. She took up her dove and ran within. Sudha! thought Kanti. What an appropriate name! Kanti returned to the boat handed his gun to his men and went over the front door of his house. He found a middle-aged Brahmin with a peaceful, clean-shaven face seated on a bench outside and reading a devotional book. Kanti saw in his kindly, thoughtful face something to the tenderness which shone in the face of the maiden. Kanti slaughtered him and said, May I ask, for some water, sir. I am very thirsty. The elder man welcomed him with eager hospitality and offering him a seat on the bench, went inside and fetched with his own hands a little brass plate of sugar wafers and a bell metal vessel full of water. After Kanti had eaten and drunk, Brahmin begged him to introduce himself. Kanti gave his own name, his father's name, and the address of his home, and then said in the usual way, If I can be of any service, sir, I shall deem my fortunate. I require no service, my son, said Nabin Banerjee. I have only one care at present. What's that, sir? said Kanti. It's my daughter Sudha, who is growing up. Kanti intentionally smiled as he thought of her babyish face. And for whom I have not yet been able to find a worthy bridegroom. If I could only see her well married, all my debt to this world would be paid. But there is no suitable bridegroom here and I cannot leave my charge of Gopinath here to search for a husband elsewhere. If you would see me in my boat, sir, we would have a talk about the marriage of your daughter. So saying, Kanti repeated his salute and went back. He then sent some of his men into the village to inquire and in answer heard nothing but praise of the beauty and the virtues of the Brahmin's daughter. When next day the old man came to the boat on his promised visit, Kanti bent low in salutation and begged the hand of his daughter for himself. The Brahmin was so much overcome by this undreamed of piece of good fortune, for Kanti not only belonged to a well-known Brahmin family, but was also a landed proprietor of wealth and position, that at first he could hardly utter a word in reply. He thought there must have been some mistake and at length mechanically repeated, You desire to marry my daughter? If you will desire to give her to me, said Kanti. You mean Sudha? he asked again. Yes, was the reply. But will you not first see and speak to her. Kanti pretending 
he had not seen her already said oh that we shall do at the moment of the auspicious vision in a voice husky with emotion the old man said my sudha is indeed a good girl well skilled in all the household arts as you are so generously taking her on trust may she never cause you a moment's regret this is my blessing the brick built mansion of the majumdars had been borrowed for the wedding ceremony which was fixed for next mark as kanti did not wish to delay in due time the bridegroom arrived on his elephant with drums and music and with a torch light procession and the ceremony began when the bridal couple were covered with the scarlet screen for the rite of the auspicious vision kanti looked up at his bride in that bashful downcast face crowned with a wedding coronet and bedecked with sandal paste he could scarcely recognize the village maiden of his fancy and in the fullness of his emotion a mist seemed to becloud his eyes at the gathering of women in the bridal chamber after the wedding ceremony was over an old village dame insisted that kanti himself should take off his wife's bridal veil as he did so he started back it was not the same girl something rose from within his breast and pierced into his brain the light of lamps seemed to grow dim the darkness to tarnish the face of the bride's herself at first he felt angry with his father-in-law the old scoundrel had shown him one girl and married him the other but on calmer reflection he remembered that the old man had not shown him any daughter at all that it was all his own fault he thought it best not to show an errant folly to the world and took his place again with the apparent calmness he could swallow the powder he could not get rid of its taste he could not bear the merry makings of the festive throng he was in the blaze of anger with himself as well as with everybody else suddenly he felt the bride seated by his side gave a little start and a suppressed scream a livered scrambling into the room had brushed across her feet close upon it followed the girl he had seen before she caught up the leveret into her arms and began to caress it with an affectionate murmuring oh, the mad girl cried the woman as they made signs to her to leave the room she hated them not however but came and unconcernedly sat in front of the wedded pair looking into their faces with a childish curiosity when a maid servant came and took her by the arm to lead her away kanti hurriedly interposed saying let her be what is your name he then went on to ask her the girl swayed backwards and forwards but gave no reply all the women in the room began to titter kanti put another question have those ducklings of yours grown up the girl stared at him as unconcernedly as before the bewildered kanti screwed up courage for another effort and asked tenderly after the wounded dove but with no avail the increasing laughter in the room betokened an amusing joke at last kanti learned that the girl was deaf and dumb the companion of all the animals and birds of the locality it was but by chance that she rose the other day when the name of sudha was called kanti now received a her second shock a black screen lifted from before his eyes 
with a sign of intense relief as of escape from carnity he looked once more into the face of his bride then came the true auspicious vision the light from his heart and from the smokeless lamps fell on her gracious face and he saw it in its true radiance knowing that nabeen's blessing would find fulfillment so here's the story finished thanks for listening